<laughs> so you remember Stephen got arrested. Stephen got arrested and uh, brought before the council. And I'm just going to read a few verses, then we'll jump in. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations true? Now, this is like a repeat of something that happened uh, just a short while before that. Uh, you know, at least 40, 50 days before that, maybe more, right? Because now we're here in chapter, Jesus stood before this same high priest and was called to, to give an account. By then they should have learned a few things, right? Apparently not. Um, this was Stephen's reply, brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we ask that your spirit would illuminate these verses and that as a result today, the kingdom seed would be sown that would bear fruit. Lord, we believe that this is your, your word. And as we were singing earlier, uh, you, you, you called, um, uh, you, you mentioned in the responsive reading that we did that, that you, you give favor to those who tremble at your word. And so, Lord, that we might do so today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. 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 So I'm just flipping pages because I'm not going to read all of that. This is a long passage in a book that's loaded with sermons and people being brought, Paul and Peter, and a lot of great messages in, in the book of Acts. And I, again, I encourage you to read, read this chapter because I, I won't be able to read it all. We're going to cover some of the verses. There's just a lot there. But it's the longest recorded message in a book of recorded messages. And, you know, some call it a kind of a legal defense. It really isn't a legal defense. Stephen really isn't defending himself. Um, he's doing something else. And he's really giving a perspective on the patriarchs. On, it, it's a review of what's happened in the, in the Old Testament, the way that God has worked uh, with his people Israel. He talks about Abraham. He talks about uh, J Joseph and his brothers he talks about Moses very prominently. He talks about David. And he talks, uh, then he you know, says some things about what they should have understood as a result of that. What's really interesting is, you all know who wrote the book, right? Who wrote? He's written by Luke. The, the, and Luke was what? A doctor. A learned person. What's interesting is that the... The, the style of Greek, and I know this not because I'm, I'm a grammarian, a Greek grammarian, but I read about Greek grammarians and what they have to say. But the, the let me flip to that quotation here. Um, the Greek grammarians who read this tell us something very interesting. That the Greek used in Stephen's speech is more formal and elaborate as you would expect a native speaker would speak. And it reflects the influence. He quotes from the version of the Old Testament that even Jesus and, and many of the, the apostles, the New Testament writers, would quote. And that is, it's called the Septuagint. And, um, and it's, a, it's a Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament Hebrew Bible. It includes a higher frequency of archaic and rare words, just in these 54 verses that, that Stephen is, is speaking. It's a different Greek than the rest of the book of Acts, which, is, which, which leads one to believe, the, the conclusion would be that Luke was possibly present, listening, or that he was given a, a almost like a textual rendition of it. Um, so it's, it's a more kind of elevated, more formal Greek. The rest of the book of Acts, the language tends to be more straightforward and narrative driven. And it's more reflective of what the everyday Greek that was spoken, which is called Koine Greek. That was the Greek of the street. 
So if you, if you understand a little bit of Greek, I know enough to be dangerous. Um, the, the Greek of the classical Greek of Homer and Plato and these folks is, is not Koine Greek. That the, the Greek that most of the New Testament is written is, is a street kind of Greek. So they had street cred. So um, that's just an interesting little tidbit there. But it, it kind of, you know, it, 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 it kind of gives credibility to what's going on there. Now, what's really interesting about this is that um, we should expect that from Stephen. Stephen was apparently so adept, and it tells us in, this is a reverse spoiler alert now, we're going back to <laughs> chapter six, that as Stephen was debating with uh, some of those, that crowd of, of freed slave uh, Greeks, Jewish Greeks, um, he was having a debate with them. It says that none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. One New Testament commentator, A.T. Robertson, says, these verses are, are saying, pardon my typing there, they continued unable, without strength enough, to take a stand against Stephen and each time he, Stephen knocked them down. That's what the, the text there uh, um, implies. He just shut them down. Saul included. Yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. Did, you, did you say that last week? Uh, you may have. Okay. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this is amazing in so many ways. It's so, Saul... Uh, was part of this group, and he couldn't stand against Stephen's wisdom. And the first thing, you know, I thought is, why is he taken? Well, he's taken not because God took him, but because he was murdered. There you go. He was killed by the action of wicked men who threw stones at him and stoned him to death. Can you imagine maybe if he had survived? Would there have been a calling of Saul? Could Stephen have been the guy that gets sent out? Who knows? We don't know the mind of God in that. I would like to believe that Saul was still called, but can you imagine that dynamic duo? But also think about the fact that Saul was there watching this and what that would have done to him. And then it, it kind of... It makes sense of verses where he talks about how he is indebted to the Jewish people to preach the gospel. Because he was responsible for so many deaths. He was actively persecuting the church of God. Paul was, was a, a terrorist, in a sense, against, against the church. But what is that speech all about? You know, you all have read the book of Acts. You all read chapter... And when you get to chapter 7, maybe, you know, you're... you're your eyes dim a little bit. You get a little sleepy. Wait, I know these stories before. I, I know about Abraham. And, but when you drill down a little deeper, you understand what he's saying. And that's what I hope to kind of explain today. What is, what is all of this about? It's not a defense. There's three main ideas here. Um, and by the way, a really interesting thing here um, uh, about... Um, Verse 10, none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit. The spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, I've, in my Bible, it's in capital S. So it's not speaking of his spirit. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through. And um, Robertson says something interesting. He says, this phrase, you know, this is kind of geeky, but... It, it, it agrees in gender, number, and case with, with the word for, for pneuma, the spirit, which is pneuma. And it indicates, here's the conclusion, the important part, that the spirit is the agent or instrument by which Stephen spoke. That's really powerful. When we share the gospel of the kingdom, we're not alone. We're never alone. When we say, Lord, here am I, send, send me, we're speaking 
in, in, in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. And you all have probably had experiences of that. I had a story I've told a few times, but, and, and sometimes you don't really feel that kind of anointing. You know, you just feel like, oh, this is an everyday conversation. But later on, you find out about the impact it may have had. Years ago, I was on a flight from uh, Denver to California. I was really grumpy. I was an um, industrial sales person in those years. Uh, and I had lost an account. I had my Bible with me. I had it on the, you know, on the table in front of me. And there was a woman sitting next to me. She saw the Bible and engaged me in a conversation that I really didn't want to have. And I'm saying to myself, oh, you know, this is not the right moment because I'm not in the right spirit. But thank God the Holy Spirit doesn't bail out on us, right? He's there whether we feel good or not. And um, she started sharing with me about what she believed. And she, she had embraced this idea of multiple lives and reincarnation. And I said, oh, you know, I, I know a verse that I could share with her. And I went to Hebrews chapter 9 somewhere and says, I said to her, well, you know, the Bible, I understand what you believe, and a lot of people believe that, and, but the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And we start talking about that. I, start, I gave her, I shared my testimony, and then, you know, we had a conversation, and it all ended, and, uh, and I forgot about it. And I went back to my life, and about a year later, I got a letter, because I had given her my business card, I got a letter at my office, I used to work up here in Chapman, and it was the story about how she had embraced Christ, that she couldn't forget the conversation that we had had. She starts reading the Bible, and as a result of that, her marriage is healed and restored. She, got, she gets back with her husband, and all these amazing things happen. Wow. I, that is the one card I have a collection of cards that I wish I wouldn't have lost in the move from when we went from Southern California to Venezuela. The Holy Spirit is always there um, speaking through his instruments. So all of these ideas of, that, that are developed in this long text uh, flow from the accusations in chapter 6. Chapter 6, uh, verse 11. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. What does that remind you of? What other famous trial where there was false testimony? Jesus. And this roused the people, the elders and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. Here we go again. Jesus, Peter, they never seem to learn, right? The lying witnesses said, this man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And at this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face, notice this, became as bright as an angel's. His face became as bright as an angel's. Now, there's always reason why details like this make the, the text. Why does Luke include that description? For one simple reason. When they saw God's glory on Stephen's face, they should have remembered someone else whose face also shone, someone they always appealed to. And that was who? Moses. 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 See, you know, they're without excuse. When Moses came down, this is Exodus 34, from Mount Sinai carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. And so when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance of Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. This is the amazing thing about Moses, you know, that 
it shows, you know, the, it maybe explains why I think it's in Second Samuel. The, Moses is attributed as the author where it says, now Moses was the most humble man on the earth, right? <laughs> but he was. You know, here's his face shining, glorious moment. He's not even aware. They should have known when they saw Stephen's shining face that it can only be the glory of God. This man was bringing them God's word just like Moses did. But it, they didn't rec- again, they don't recognize the day and the hour of their visitation. I wonder, by the way, if when Paul is hearing that, and more than likely seeing that face shining, whether this is what he had in mind when years later, in about 50, probably 20 years after the fact, he writes this in 2 Corinthians. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This, new, this is a covenant not of written laws, but of the spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the spirit gives life. The old way with laws etched in stone led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness of that, the brightness, brightening, brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect a far greater glory under the new way? Now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? That's, a, by the way, a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Maybe, maybe you haven't seen people's face. I have seen people, I mean, not literally shining, but you can see that on people's faces when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They shine. They shine because it's the glory reflecting the glory of God. He goes on and he says, if the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way that makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of the new way. So, they're seeing this glory on the face of Stephen, and they should have thought about the glory of God in the face of Moses. He should have also thought about the glory that used to be in the temple and was no longer there, and they knew it. They knew about what theologians call the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah, as some might may pronounce it. Um, And it had departed from the temple. Any Bible scholars here remember when that glory departed from the temple? It's outlined in the book of Ezekiel in a very dramatic way. I'm going to read it to you. When does this happen? It happens in Ezekiel 10. So here are, here is the council berating him. Oh, the temple, you said that the temple is going to be destroyed. Stephen was just probably preaching about how the Lord is building a new temple not made of stones um, because God doesn't live in places built by human hands anyway. And Jesus said, by the way, if you don't repent, you know, this place, remember Matthew 21 and 22 and 23, the indictments, not one stone. He's probably preaching the words of the Sermon on the Mount. Not one stone will be left upon another because because you did not recognize the day of your visitation because they rejected the Messiah. And God gives them more opportunities. He sends more of his servants, including now Stephen. And they knew that this was now all a farce. This was just about making money, about manipulating people. Money exchangers, it had become a business. Jesus had cleared out the temple at least two times. And they knew because that whenever the high priest would go into the holy place, that glory was no longer there. It had departed. It had departed around the time of Ezekiel. That's 500 years plus in the past. So this is now a temple 
devoid of the presence. Momentarily, the Lord's presence comes in through the ministry of Jesus as he's preaching there in Solomon's colonnade and entering in the temple to teach. But in Ezekiel um, 10, we read about this then. The glory of the Lord moved out. This is a vision, by the way, that Ezekiel gets. Ezekiel is kind of transported in the spirit from uh, his, um, uh, his, he had been deported to Babylon. He's in Babylon, but he's seeing all of this playing out in the spirit. Just an amazing, amazing book. Then the glory of the Lord moved out from the entrance of the temple and hovered above the cherubim. And as I watched, the cherubim flew with their wheels to the east gate of the Lord's temple. And the glory of the Lord of Israel hovered above them. And then the cherubim, the same ones that Isaiah describes in the the verse that I read during the worship. Cherubim lifted their wings and rose into the air with their wheels beside them. And so the glory of the God of Israel hovered above, above them. By the way, what what do wheels imply? Mobility, motion, right? Basically, it's communicating this. The glory of God is mobile. It's a mobile feast. And by the way, Ezekiel sees that vision in in Babylon. In fact, the, the glory of God goes over to where the exiles were. Read all of that. It's really wonderful. Then the glory, this is, the glory of the Lord went up from the city and stopped Above a mountain to the east. What's that mountain to the east? That's the Mount of Olives. Through the east gate. If you were to go to Israel. I wish I had that picture today. Today if you go to Jerusalem. And you stand on the Mount of Olives. And you look. You can see the east gate. It's been shut. You know. With stones. In other words. When the king returns. We're going to keep him out. Because the prophecies are. That when the Lord returns. His feet shall stand Upon, in Zechariah, upon the Mount of Olives. When he descends, he's going to come down upon the Mount of Olives. And these geological movements, you know, signs and wonders will occur as the Lord begins to restore the earth, beginning with the restoration of the, the so-called Dead Sea. Where was I with that? Hmm. And, and by the way, that's the way the book of Acts begins, Right? Jesus gives some words to the disciples, and then he's, they, they, I remember they asked questions, you know, when, when are you going to come back? What's going to be the end of the age? He said, he said that's, for the, the, that's in the Father's knowledge, not for you to know now. But he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Samaria, Judea, and through the uttermost parts of the earth. And then what happens? As he's standing there with them on the Mount of Olives, he's lifted up and he goes in, he ascends into heaven. And you remember what happens there? No, wait, don't go. They were fully expecting he was going to usher the kingdom in now. He goes, that's delayed for a purpose. And what did the angels tell those disciples that were there? Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you will come back in the same way. And it, it lines up with Ezekiel, it lines up with, with Zechariah and so forth. By the way, the glory of the Lord departed in Ezekiel, never came back. And, you know, by, this is not just, you know, the opinion of Christians and, um, and people like me uh, who are trying to make an argument. The Jewish people knew that too. It's in their targums, in the rabbinical writings. Here's a quote from um, Yoma 21b in the Talmud. The Talmud discusses the absence of several key elements in the second temple. That was the the temple uh, that had been rebuilt after the destruction uh, by the Babylonians. This includes the Ark of the Covenant, which disappeared, nobody knows. Some people think it's under the... Uh, Mount Moriah. It's an interesting thing. And that the blood from the cross dripped down through the substrata, through the rock, back onto the Holy of Holies. I don't know. Some people think it's in Ethiopia. In fact, the Ethiopians claim that it's there in Addis Ababa. Who knows? 
I've never seen it with my own eyes. But it's gone. The Urim and the Thummim that the high priest would use to discern God's will. The holy fire, and here it is, the Shekinah. And the Holy Spirit of, of prophecy, as the Talmud states. In five things, the first sanctuary differed. Where is it? Oak it's in Oak Island. <laughs> you watch that show? <laughs> you, you watch that show? Oh, man, Kathy and I got drawn into that. You just couldn't say no because, you know, they're about to find it. Forever. <laughs> Are you still at it? You know, that, that one thing could be the answer to the whole story. <laughs> that small piece of bone. <laughs> In five things, the first sanctuary differed from the second. It is basically a repeat. The ark cover, the cherubim, the fire, the shekinah, another place in the targums, in the, in the writings, in the Urim and the Thummim. This passage indicates that the shekinah, or the visible presence, was absent from the temple. So these are Talmudic and rabbinical traditions. What are they defending then? Why are they coming against you know, Peter and now Stephen and, and before that Jesus? They're defending an empty place that they should have realized wasn't God's home to begin with. It was an accommodation to them. We'll read more about this later. In, in fact, uh, they said there's a, there a Hebrew word for the glory has departed. We read about it in, second, in 1 Samuel uh, where a woman names her child Ichabod, which means where is the glory? For they said Israel's glory is gone and she named him this because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. Then she said, the glory has departed, Ichabod, for the ark of God has been captured. Where is the glory today? It's right here. <laughs> it's within you. <laughs> right? The Lord uh, is has built is building he said i will build my church and peter tells us how with what with living stones that's each of you and each of you each one of us has the spirit indwelling and this is why when you come to church there are some tangible things that happen or should happen right if we're loving one another if we're obeying what jesus has called us to do if we're worshiping him with all our hearts. Some of those tangible things is that your spirit is lifted up. God does miraculous things according to his will. And there's, there's a, a fellowship that, that it just, it, it's pregnant with the presence of the Lord. Sometimes that glory waxes and wanes, but it never, never goes away. Sometimes it increases. And you feel it. Maybe you felt it this morning as we were singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth. There's only one word to describe. There's only one word that comes to mind. That's speaking from the standpoint of Isaiah. All he could say was, Kadosh, 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 which in his mind meant it beyond me. It, it's, it's, it's inexplicable. It's it's eternal, it's transcendent, it's, it, it, it can't be described. And the Jews had a word for that, kadosh. The glory of God had departed from the temple. As, even as Stephen is speaking, it wasn't there. It was now at work somewhere else. And that's the whole reason, by the way, for the book of Acts. If we get to the end, I'm going to cover a little bit more, and then we're all going to take a break because there's so much there. I'll show you a chart because the book of, Revela the book of Acts, rather, my mind's always on the book of Revelation. I can't get out of the book of Revelation. That's one of the things I want to cover when we do the deep dive is Revelation from a different perspective, not, you know, helicopters and H-bombs going off. And <laughs> what it really means Right? I say that humbly. But um, where was I? I have a, a way of kind of rabbit trailing. Huh? Book of Acts. Book of Acts. 
The book of Acts is the record of a, the spirit-empowered church breaking through cultural barriers. And in this chapter, it's now breaking into the Greek-speaking Jews. And then it's going to break into the, the Greek-speaking world, unbelieving world after that. And, and then through every cultural barrier, this is why we need the Spirit. Yes. We can't break cultural barriers without the Holy Spirit. Yes. It was an insider movement. It was an insider movement. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> There's a lot more to that than meets the eye. Uh, so what's going on? Why did the glory depart? In a, in one, in a, in a, in a nutshell... One word, idolatry, idolatry, idolatry and wickedness, blatant injustice, the abuse of, of the poor. It was it just horrible. But the, the core of it was they had stopped worshiping God. And as they stopped worshiping God, the measure of the spirit was withdrawn. God could no longer. In Ezekiel, it talks about the perspective from the Lord, how detestable the, the unbelievable things that were being done in the temple. They had turned the temple into like a, like a, a hall of prostitution. And they were worshiping wicked gods and they had set up all of these different altars to the gods of their, their neighbors. So what's amazing is that it seems like God was somewhat patient until he no longer could be. Son of man, do you see what they're doing? He's God speaking to Ezekiel, saying, look what's happening in the temple. They were getting an x-ray vision into what's happening in the hidden rooms of the temple. Do you see the detestable sins the people of Israel are committing to drive me from my temple? But come and you will see even more detestable sins than these. So I went in and saw the walls covered He's, this is all happening in the spirit with engravings of all kinds of crawling animals and detestable creatures. I also saw the various idols worshipped by the people of Israel. When, when you read this, what should come to mind is what Paul is describing in Romans 1. Because they would not retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over. He, God says, if, if that's what you want, go after it. He enables them to do that. He releases them to their decision. More on that some other time. And then the 70 leaders of Israel were standing there with Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, in the center. So even though there were some exiles already in Babylon, remember the whole exile, in, there were three ma main deportations. There were still some people in Israel, and they were still trying to make it happen. They're, they're appealing to God's other gods, to save them from uh, utter destruction. And so they're each of them holding an incense burner from which a cloud of incense rose. What are they doing? Are they worshiping? No. Then he said to me, the sins of the people of Israel and Judah are very great. The entire land is full of murder. The city is filled with injustice. They're saying, the Lord doesn't see it. The Lord has abandoned their land. The land. That's what they're accusing God of. They didn't look at their own at their own idolatry. Money, power, the glory had departed, they knew it. Jesus talks about it in the parable of the tenants. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. What's the bottom line of all of this? That the council should have listened to Jesus. They didn't. He sent messengers. They didn't. They hardened their heart. And these were empowered messengers who bore the glory. The council should have now listened to Stephen. And of course, we know that they will not. The Sanhedrin thought that they were somehow privileged that regardless of how they behaved and what they did, God was obliged to them because he had made a covenant with them. What they didn't realize is that covenant was conditional on what? 
on their obedience. And they weren't obeying. Stephen is, is proving that God, in, in his argument, here, here's the, the essence of it. He's proving that God will always adapt and move to fulfill his salvation purposes through a people who obey his spirit. I'm just going to cover three things here, and then we'll take a break, And because I have so much. I mean, I just... But I got two weeks, all right? So there's, there's, there's three main ideas. First, that there's progress and change in God's plan to save the world. Um, Bible Knowledge Commentary has some really great stuff on that, if you have a copy of that. Stephen developed his thought in five points. First, the promise to Abraham from working. What happens? Why, did he, why does he bring up Abraham? What he's trying to say is, look, God's going to move on, right? What happens with Abraham? When does God call Abraham? In what place? Chapter 12 of Genesis. What was chapter 11? The Tower of Babel. God wanted to work with humanity. But no, they said, we're going to defy you. We're going to build a tower so you can't flood us again. We'll go all the way to the top. I'll show you. And so God says, okay, you know what? I can build a nation from one person. He goes and calls Abraham, who's just walking around one day. Going, and he, well, he, one person couldn't even have kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> barren, barren. Oh, they're just mind-blowing. Thank you for saying. Don't lose faith. No matter how desperate or impossible any situation can be, God is the God of the impossible because he, he will give his spirit to those who ask him to break through any barrier. Nothing can hold him back. And so the Lord moves through Abraham and, and then what happens? You know, the Abraham, he's kind of, you know, bouncing around and, you know, finally, you know, Jacob comes along and here the promise is going to be fulfilled through Jacob and his sons. What do his sons do? They try to murder their brother, Joseph. But God adapts to that. And then he begins to work through Joseph. And then Joseph is taken uh, a prisoner and, and tried to kill, be killed by, in, in several, you know, he's in prison and his life is desperate, but then he gets rescued out. He in, interprets the dreams. Stephen is telling all of these stories because he's saying, don't be proud. God will find a way. He's always changing. So he's saying to them, you are so arrogant. Look at your own history. Look how God has worked. And he follows that history through meticulously. Even in the sojourn of Joseph. The move, was, the move to Egypt was a fulfillment of God's prediction. But it, too, it was too radical, a change for Jacob's descendants. They couldn't figure out. What God was doing, God rescues them. He delivers the people under Moses. And a major portion of Stephen's discourse pertained to Moses and the Exodus, another important aspect of Israel's history. They were there for 400 years. God rescues them by using another very unlikely character. And then there's the tabernacle. First of all, you know, he's arguing here, look, you, you forget the tabernacle used to be out in the wilderness. It was just a tent, you know, with some animal skins. And if you think, it wasn't this huge building. You know, David asked to build it. He talks about David, too. And Solomon, David couldn't uh, do the building because what his hands were tainted with blood. But God acquiesced to Solomon. Okay, yeah, you can build it. But over and over again through the prophets and in the Psalms, you read, what, what can you build me? What temple will house me? Um, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where are you going to put me, God says. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here, but... Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> see, this is, what he's, this is what's going on here. He's, he's appealing. God is appealing uh, through Stephen. The Holy Spirit is appealing. That's why this, that's why this, this discourse is so brilliant. 
When you look into it, it's just massively brilliant. He's telling him, look at your history. You should get a clue. Then there's another um, main idea. I'm skipping through a lot of... Um, you know. The point is clear. If God has changed so many things in Israel's history, what is to say that the law and temple were permanent? That was the crux of his argument. You know, you're, you're so, you know, fixated on law and temple, law and temple. Jesus said, Jesus said to them, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Here, Jesus is coming as the living law. He was the law. I love that moment in the movie, In the Chosen, when he says to the, to the Pharisees, he says, I am the law of Moses. Oh, and he was, he is. The blessings, number two, the blessings of God are not limited to the land of Israel and the temple area. That's what he's arguing. And he's giving example after example. Some of Israel's greatest favors were bestowed apart from the, from the temple and the land. That's an amazing point that he fleshes out. Israel's patriarchs and leaders were blessed outside the land. He gives examples of that. Abraham was called where? In Mesopotamia. In a foreign, you know, godless land of, of idol worshipers. Uh, Moses was commissioned by God. In where? In Midian. He's called in Midian when he's out there running away. Uh, to substantiate the fact that God blessed Moses while he was in Midian, Stephen carefully recounted the two sons that were born to Moses. He's making an argument here. The law itself was given outside the land. There's nothing so holy about this place. The tabernacle was built in the desert. Even the temple, though it was in the land, was not to be limited in its theology. Israel had a long history of rebellion against God. There was a long pattern of opposition uh, to God's will. What can we get from this? We should understand God's presence. We should understand, understand God's presence. Stephen emphasizes that God's presence is not confined to a specific building or location. Worship and spiritual growth can occur anywhere, not just within the walls of the church. And by the way, I'm, I'm high on the local church. I don't think there's a single Christian that I can find, if you find one in the New Testament, outside of the thief on the cross that didn't have a cho choice, who's not connected to a local church. I'm not saying about being connected to an institution as informal church membership. We don't even have that. Some churches do. That's fine. But it's vital to be connected to a community of living stones and to process things so that we hear God together, that we pray together. That's what you know, we've endeavored to, to do more and more of. Talk to others. God will speak to you through others. I have it happen to me all the time in this church where I hear something and I go... Wow, that, that was the Lord. The Lord spoke to me this morning. By the way, uh, Laura, we have that book over there now. I bought a book. You were telling me a place to, to log, you know, when the Lord gives a word to the church. This understanding encourages um, us to seek God. Encourages, you know, I'm sorry. Believers. believers, there's a word missing there. In our daily lives, at home, at work, in our communities fostering a more personal and pervasive relationship with him. Where is God at work? Here and now, my friends. That was the purpose for reading this book. Because it's not just the, the, the big bang to come. It's not just revival. I, I love the idea of revival. Revival will come. We desperately need revival. But God isn't waiting for people to repent so that the nation is revived. He's not waiting for that moment. He's at work now, in the here and now, in the small things, in the in-between time, in the, what's the name? I had a theological word for that a few months ago. <laughs> in, the, in the liminal spaces. Some, some. <laughs> Second, we should listen to the people that God sends to us. Not blindly, 
not be manipulated. There's a lot of that in the body of Christ. We have to be careful with that. We have to pray. That's why the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 14 that some should prophesy and the others should carefully consider what is being said. That's a new way of prophesying. Wasn't that way in the Old Testament? It was thus saith the Lord. In the New Testament, we can't say thus saith the Lord. We say, I believe God might be saying this. And then we process that together. Could very well be God, but he'll show you too. Stephen points out the historical pattern of rejecting God's messengers. You've done this before. Uh, we should learn the importance of being open to spiritual guidance and prophetic voices, even when the message challenges the status quo. This calls for humility and discernment in receiving teaching and recognizing that God can speak through various individuals and situations. It encourages a posture of listening and responsiveness to God's direction. I encourage you to up the ante this year on your devotional time. Amen. Hear God. Lastly, prioritize faithfulness over ritual. Um, this is what, <laughs> what I, you know, the main message of Isaiah. What he's saying to the... Isaiah's, after chapter 40, he's now speaking pro proleptically into the future to the people who will be in Babylon. It's an amazing book. All the books are amazing. Isaiah is just beyond amazing. But he, he, he's, he's telling the exiles in the future, he's about 120 years before them, he's saying, I'm, doing, I'm about to do something new. You see, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness so you can get back to the land. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. We have to understand our roots. Stephen's speech demonstrates a deep knowledge of Israel's history and God's faithfulness. By knowing the Old Testament, we gain insight into God's character, promises, and foundation of our faith. I, I encourage you, don't be discouraged with, your, with, with Bible study and devotional Bible reading. When, if, if the enemy tries to bore you, dig in deeper, because there's so much there. God will speak to you, sometimes in ways that will surprise you. Even in you know, books like Leviticus, the spirit can jump out through the page. Be continually filled with the spirit. Empowerment for witnessing. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit, which gave him wisdom, courage, and the ability to speak powerfully. We should seek to be filled and live out our lives with our, our faith boldly and effectively. Now, the idea there comes from Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled. And the... the the tense there, be filled, is in present continuous tense, which means be continually filled in an ongoing action. This indicates that being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time event, but a continual process. Lastly, have the courage to stand for the truth. Amen. This is the hard part, right? But the Holy Spirit will give us boldness. The church prays for that in the book of Acts, I think several times. Have the courage. Stephen's unwavering commitment to the truth, even in the face of opposition and death, is a powerful example. We should strive to stand firm in our faith and proclaim the truth of the gospel, regardless of the consequences. This courage comes from a deep trust in God and a willingness to obey him above all else. This is the picture that I was alluding to and it kind of shows what's happening this is from a paper that I did in way back in seminary but Acts 1 you shall receive power it breaks through the unbelief of the even the, what, the 120 and the people that were in Jerusalem it breaks through Greek speak to Greek speaking Jews it breaks through into the Samaritans it breaks through in chapter 10 to Gentiles who were God-fearers. In Acts 13, the Gentiles who were familiar with belief in the true God, and 
the gospel reaches them, the gospel of the kingdom. In Acts 17, Gentiles with almost no knowledge of the true God, Paul on Mars Hill, says, you know, I'll tell you, I come to talk to you about that unknown God. And then in Acts 19, the Gentiles hostile to belief in the true God. And all the way through uh, chapter 28. Let's pray. And then we're going to... We're going to eat. We're going to have communion as, after we get settled and serve ourselves, um, as the early church probably did. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the life of Stephen. Thank you for this example of this brilliant young man who spoke with courage and probably, not probably, changes the lives, the life of of Paul, who wrote most of our New Testament. Thank you for the faithfulness. Thank you for the glory that you displayed in him. And may your glory be displayed also in our lives, that uh, we would truly be your disciples and demonstrate your love uh, to a world that desperately needs it. And we thank you for your goodness. All of God's people said, amen. Amen.